And we've actually discovered there are more than a thousand forms of gluten. So when we use the term gluten, you know, we use it as this as a singular term, but it's actually a fam gluten is a family of proteins. So you know, corn has its own family of glutens. Rice has its own family of glutens, and, and these glutens are very similar from one grain to the other. And what we get, and some people react to the rice gluten, some people are reacting to the corn gluten more aggressively than they're reacting to the wheat gluten. But they're being told corn and rice are gluten-free products. So people with gluten sensitivity, their, their, their normal response to consumption of grain is actually an inflammatory response. The body is rejecting it. So in part of that rejection, it's, it's attacking it and creating an inflammatory response to get rid of it. You know, for many people, the grain itself actually induces hormonal change. Because it creates inflammation, it causes your body's normal response to it is to try to make more cortisol. Cortisol is the hormone we make to fight inflammation. Hey folks, it's Mike Mutzler here with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thank you so much for tuning back in episode number 126. And today we're live with my friend, Dr. Peter Osborne. He has a great new book out called No Grain, No Pain. And he's going to talk all about the book today and some uh, give you some ideas and concepts and help you eliminate pain. And I myself have suffered from back pain from overuse and exercise and, and found that when I eat uh, not real food and processed food, my pain does come back. So there's a lot of truth to this. And I know you guys uh, you know, probably experienced this in your own life, but he's going to provide a lot of tips. And for example, I think we can start off, Dr. Peter, I was born with uh, grain inflammation. And that's one of the concepts that I learned from your book. Maybe if you could explain what that is and, and the, this link between grain consumption and pain. Yeah, so grain inflammation is kind of a broad term. It it we can we can dive into the to the nichiness of it, but there are never there are a number of different mechanisms where where grain consumption can induce an inflammatory state. And one of them, one of the primary ones, which probably your audience is very familiar with, is this concept known as gluten sensitivity, um, which is which is extremely popular. It's it's a it's um you know we've got a gluten free aisle in most major grocery stores at this point, so it's it's not an unheard of term or used to be you you'd get looked at like you're a witch doctor if you brought up gluten but today it's it's pretty widely accepted even in the scientific communities so people with gluten sensitivity their 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 normal response to consumption of grain is actually an inflammatory response the body is rejecting it so in part of that rejection it's it's attacking it and creating an inflammatory response to get rid of it and um and so that's one aspect of grain inflammation um but there are several other forms of grain inflammation. One of the other ones that's very commonly missed is the element that grains are very, very rich in mycotoxins. These are, these are toxins produced as a result of, of chronic mold exposure. So when grains are stored in our, in our farming environment today, grains are generally stored in large, in large silos where they're kept for long periods of time before they're actually processed and sent out. And, and, the, and this, this creates a lot of mold growth and in that process of mold growth, mold creates chemical backdrop toxins. These toxins are called mycotoxins. There are a number of different kinds. Uh, probably one of the more common one is, is aflo aflatoxin. There's another one called fumonacin, which is notoriously found in wheat and corn. And so these mycotoxins, just like so many people are allergic to molds, so many people are allergic to the molds and the mold toxins that are found within the grain products. And so maybe it's somebody who's not even gluten sensitive, would react to bread or would react to a bread or pasta or cereal based product because they're reacting to a mycotoxin or to a mold toxin. And that that's just another element to inflammation. Then you have the, the, the pesticide exposure, um, the huge quantity of pesticides that are used in farming today. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the things we see repetitively, if you, if you ever, I don't know if you're in tune with, with this, but you'll see, Kind of a farmer out in the field apply, with the application of pesticides is actually wearing one of these chem warfare suits, right? To protect them <laughs> right. from from being totally coated in a in a in a severe poison, and yet we're putting that in the food supply and we're saying, hey, this is generally a safe thing for people to eat right. eight to ten servings of every day. And the reality is, is many of these many of these pesticides, well, atrazine is one of them. It's a weed killer, and it and it is it works like an estrogen. And, and, and part of the process is that in, in, at least in amphibious creatures, it causes the men to become women because of its estrogenic effect. So it, it actually, the male fish start laying eggs, the, the male salamanders start laying eggs. So we get this kind of sex change, gender change, chemically induced as a result of atrazine. And, and, but beyond that, we've got this other one called Roundup or otherwise known as glyphosate, which is a, a, a severe toxin on the gut. It can cause leaky gut. It can cause microbial imbalance in the gut. 
It can lead to mineral malabsorption in the gut. So there's all these processes that basically contribute to the inflammatory cascades. And so gray inflammation is kind of, those are some of the, some of the mechanisms I talk about in the book. There are more, but those are, you know, three really big ones that, that I think people should be very aware of and concerned about, especially considering our government recommends such a severe quantity of grains in the diet as a staple. And, uh, and, you know, generally speaking, most people feel like whole grains are a healthy thing to eat and that this whole gluten free thing is a really, it's, it's really quite kind of fringe or quite like radical, but, but realize that it has more to do with than just gluten. It's, it's the grain inflammation. It's all the other components to the grain, not just the gluten itself. Yeah, that's really important. I don't think anyone's really talking about that, the atrazine, glyphosate, and the mold. So let's let's talk about gluten a little bit because I think that that's an important aspect of the conversation. But how, like you were just kind of leading into, that gluten is not just found in wheat-containing products. And a lot of people have like gluten-free corn chips, you know, fried in corn oil. But one of the concepts that I learned, you know, from our last discussion, Dr. Osborne, in, in your book is that gluten and, and other grains have their own anti-nutrients and so forth. Um, I should say other grains have forms of gluten that aren't really called gluten necessarily or would would be sometimes marketed as gluten free yet there are gluten forms in them. Can you explain that in a little deeper? Yeah, sure. So so the definition of gluten actually comes from research that was done in 1952 and it, it was actually done at the University of Alabama Birmingham where where this this protein called alpha gliadin was discovered. Now this study was done on 10 people, which is, you know, when we talk about evidence-based medicine, you know, we always say we, we need larger scale trials that are double blind and randomized and placebo controlled in order to have real true scientific evidence, right? right. But this study was done on 10 people where they isolated alpha gliadin, which is one of the forms of gluten found in wheat, barley, and rye. And they found that this particular type of protein was, was part of the triggering inflammatory response that created celiac disease. And unfortunately, that that kind of was the the fundamental foundation for everything moving forward. In essence, wheat, barley, and rye were the were the grains that people should avoid, but all the other grains were safe, even though the science doesn't really support that. Um, so so what's happened up to now? So if we go from 1952 to now. We've actually discovered there are more than a thousand forms of gluten. So when we use the term gluten, you know, we use it as this as a singular term, but it's actually a fam gluten is a family of proteins. So, you know, corn has its own family of glutens. Rice has its own family of glutens. And, and these glutens are very similar from one grain to the other. And what we get, and some people react to the rice gluten. Some people are reacting to the corn gluten more aggressively than they're reacting to the wheat gluten. Mm. But they're being told corn and rice are gluten-free products. So they're very, very confused. And what they do is they end up going to the corn bread and the rice bread and the pastas and the cereals and things of that nature. And not only are they continuing to get a gluten that's creating an immune reaction that's leading to inflammation and hormonal changes and weight gain and pain, but they're also getting high, high concentrated levels of those mycotoxins we were talking about earlier. As a matter of fact, gluten-free food products are one of the most concentrated sources in the American diet of mycotoxin. Mm. Uh, and this is several studies have shown that there are high levels of mycotoxin in these products. So again, going back to one, alpha gliadin is only found in wheat, barley, and rye, but you know, corn has a set of glutens, rice has a set of glutens, and that these glutens have also been shown to create the same type of inflammation, and in some cases, even more aggressive inf inflammation than what was previously thought. As a matter of fact, every time we go back and study a grain additionally, we, we learn about its glutens, and then we compare that, that those people who are celiac or who have gluten sensitivity, and we try to feed them these grains, what we find consistently is the presence of inflammation that just won't go away until we get grain out of their diet. Wow. So if a product, a commercial product says gluten free, that they're just looking at alpha gliadin, is that it? That's it. Um, yeah, the FDA passed this law in August of 2014. And uh, basically it's, it's, it's the, the gluten law, the gluten food labeling law, which, which states that if a product is, is free of alpha gliadin to 20 parts per million, it can legally be called gluten free. So your oats, can be called gluten free, even though they're not. The corn can be called gluten free. The name of the gluten in corn, well, the main one is zein, and Z E I N, and that and that particular gluten has actually been shown in, in a study in 2012 to create um, more inflammatory damage and bind with the nuclear receptor, the genetic receptor that gluten binds to in, in human immune cells better than wheat. Mm. So, so corn, in my opinion, is probably one of the biggest fundamental grains that people fail to avoid and, and continue to maintain their illness as a result of it.
Gosh, that's really scary stuff. But I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation because gluten-free has almost become synonymous with healthy. You know, people, if they see a gluten-free dessert, gluten-free beer, it's like, it's almost like zero calorie. That's kind of mindset. So people almost <laughs> gravitate towards it. And and they wonder why they're still overweight and sick. And like we're talking about today, have pain and, and other issues. So, um, you know, the diet is really tough for people sometimes just to eat real food. So, so what are some things that strategies to help well, I guess, first of all, people have probably had chronic inflammatory immune responses if they've been eating even gluten-free products for some time. So talk to us about this transition for people, you know, to eliminate the pain and, and kind of calm down this inflammatory response. Are any, you know, any, can you shorten the learning curve so that they can, uh, you know, take some supplements or do some exercises? What do you have in terms of advice? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a number of things that can shorten the learning curve. And the, and the first thing is to change the diet. I mean, you know, the, the, whole, the whole premise here is input equals output, right? So if you put in foods that create inflammation, then your output is going to be inflammation. And if you're already inflamed and that inflammation is leading to chronic degenerative pains, whether it be your low back or whether it be some other tendon, ligament, joint, et cetera, we even have patients with, with what I call hormone pain. You know, the, 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 the grain itself is affecting their ability to make thyroid hormone or it's affecting their ability to make adrenal hormones. And so they can't fight inflammation as well, or, or their metabolism slows down or they're lethargic and they have low energy. So so it's not just physical pain per se. It can be hormonal pain. It can be other forms of pain that we don't classically consider. You know, acid reflux is painful, mm -hmm. but it doesn't happen to the joints, but it can be caused by grain. So, so from a very simple perspective, you know, the easiest thing to do is avoid grain. And that's, you know, wheat, barley, rye, and oats, also corn, also rice, also sorghum, millet, teff, triticale. Those are your kind of your main grains that are being used in the U.S. today. Um, so, so gravitating away from those is certainly going to change the input, which is going to lead to a reduction in inflammation and pain. But secondary to that, how do we speed up that curve? Well, one of the ways, there, there are a number of supplements naturally that can help fight inflammation. But I, I would say this, I would caution people from jumping on that bandwagon too aggressively because we want to know whether the diet changed the pain. We don't want to know whether the supplement, you know, artificially manipulated or controlled the pain, Right. Now, we can use the supplement to reduce pain in somebody whose quality of life is so poor that they just need more help. And I do that very commonly in my clinic. But if you're just, let's just say you're just the average guy trying to ride his bike three or four times a week, but your knees are always hurting, or your hips are always hurting, and it's really hard for you to do that. You know, I would say take the diet consideration first. Let's see how much pain relief you can get as a result of that. Now, now one of the other things I recommend people do, and I like this analogy, Mike, because um, – it, it, if people understand this this analogy, it'll make better sense. You know, if you roll over in your car, you're driving in your car, and let's say you roll over a nail and you puncture the tire, um, you can take the nail out of the tire, right? And mm. your tire's still flat. And that's like removing grain. You can remove the grain from your diet, but the damage, i.e. the flat tire, is still there. And so sometimes the body can heal the damage on its own. Its own innate intelligence will kick in if your other nutrition and everything else is solid the body will heal. But let's take that person who's been damaged for five or 15 years, you know, five, 10, 15 years, long-term inflammatory damage. Sometimes these individuals have developed key nutritional deficiencies. They've developed zinc deficiency or vitamin C deficiency or omega-3 fatty acid deficiency. So their body doesn't have the nutritional tools, right, to, to fix that broken tire, so to speak, right? And so one of the things we do in our clinic is we measure these. We measure these nutrients. We, we actually do blood tests that can measure a person's nutritional status so that we can target supplement them as an individual. And that way we're very accurate and we're not wasting, you know, hundreds of dollars on supplements a month trying to hit the mark with something that they may not even need. So it really allows us to dial it in and really accelerate their healing curve to a much, much, uh, much quicker level. Mm -hmm. Before we talk about the testing, something came up and I didn't want to interrupt you because you were on a roll right there is the hidden glutens in food. And so, you know, one thing, for example, like, and I learned this in the last year is like sushi rice is rolled in wheat and, and there's other ways that, and rice I think would be avoided anyway due to the, the different uh, gluten types, type uh, forms in rice and so forth. But any hidden forms uh, of gluten or other anti-nutrients related to gluten in the diet that people should be aware of and, and that you find patients struggling with? Yeah, a lot of your condiments and salad dressings, soups, if you're going to a restaurant, they're thickened oftentimes with wheat. Sometimes the meat is injected with a chemical that mimics gluten called microbial transglutaminase. Same thing with cheeses and dairy. That's why so many people 
um, you know, as you know, with your expertise in autism, that you know, gluten-free, casein-free diets are more effective than gluten-free diets alone, and that's one of the reasons why is the way dairy gets processed with with that chemical called MTG. So, you know, if you're looking at processed dairy, understand that it it can mimic gluten, even though it's not gluten, and that's something that a lot of people don't understand. Um, mm. But then you also have there are a lot of other hidden sources. If you went out to eat, for example, cross contamination in the kitchen. You know, there may be some, you know, some hidden breadcrumbs in your salad. Maybe they pulled the croutons out by hand because they forgot at the end before they brought the salad out to you. Uh, maybe it's in your ketchup in the form of a fructose corn syrup, and you didn't realize that there was corn syrup in your ketchup. So there, there really are, and you have to be really diligent with reading your food labels. Um, we actually have a list. I've compiled a list of all those kind of tricky terms that if, if people are, are kind of wanting to know, okay, what is it, you know, like, for example, hydrolyzed vegetable protein, who knows that that's wheat, right? Who knows that that's actually soy? Not, not very many people do. So we've compiled that list of food ingredients that you might find on a label. Now, people can find that there's a, on glutenfreesociety.org, there's a, there's a big, uh, there's a big uh, marker that just says um, uh, gluten in foods. And it, it's, I think it says something like to the nature of the list, like get the list of the hidden terms for gluten. And that, that's free for anybody who wants it. Just go there. You can print it out if you want to become more familiar with those hidden glutens. Mm, awesome. Now, I didn't want to interrupt you. I think you wanted to dive into lab testing. And so one question kind of comes to mind, and this is related to the book a little bit, but I'm sure you get this a lot, is is why is gluten sensitivity on the rise? Why is celiac on the rise? And you know, my thinking process based upon what you told me is that there's all these other factors in wheat, you know, like we talked about the mold, atrazine, glyphosate, but is our immune system changing and so forth? Like, do you want to get into that? And then how would you assess that from a testing standpoint? Yeah, that's a great question. I think some people are misdiagnosed. You know, the, the, I'm a very, very big fan of testing because so many people guess, but they guess wrong or they guess and, and, and they guess from the premise of guilt by association. So, Kind of what I mean by that is that, you know, if the old thing, if you walk out in the driveway's wet, you assume it rained, right? But what if it didn't rain? What if the hose broke? What if the sprinklers were on? What if somebody washed their car? There's other possibilities. And we have to be careful, especially in science, of making the claim of guilt by association. So when it comes to when it comes to gluten sensitivity, you know, gluten sensitivity is not a disease. It's no more a disease than a peanut allergy. You know, if a person's allergic to a peanut and they eat a peanut, they pay the consequences of eating the peanut because they're allergic to it. Well, gluten is much the same way. The sensitivity is a state of genetics. And we look at genetic markers to help identify whether a person's gluten sensitive. So, you know, in essence, what happens if a person has certain subsets, you know, it's similar to these SNP tests that like 23andMe and some of these other companies are doing, only it's, it's much to a much greater degree, more specific and sensitive for gluten specifically, in that we're looking at genetic patterns. And if a person has certain genetic patterns, and the name of the gene we're looking at is, is called HLA-DQA1 and HLA-DQ-beta-1 gene. Um, if a person has certain genetic patterns on this gene, then their normal reaction to gluten exposure is going to be inflammation. And so, again, it's not a disease. It's just the way their body sees it. Their body sees that gluten protein or that family of gluten proteins more as an enemy as opposed to a friend. And so the more consistently they consume gluten over time, the more inflammation they create until their body hits a breaking point. You know, the bodies, our bodies are adaptive. They're resilient. They can adapt to a certain point, but when the proverbial straw breaks the back, it really breaks the back. And that's when disease starts to show up. And there are about 190 different forms of disease that we know gluten can either contribute to or cause directly. And that's why it can get so confusing because most people think that celiac disease and gluten sensitivity are the same thing and they're not. And we can make the statement that everyone with celiac disease is gluten sensitive, but we cannot make the statement that everybody with gluten sensitivity will develop celiac disease. There are lots of other diseases people can develop. For example, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, type 1 diabetes has the same genetic linkages. Um, autism, bipolar disease, schizophrenia, depression, IBS, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's. There's all kinds of autoimmune diseases that exist as a result uh, of gluten exposure. And, and it's not just gluten. There are other factors in the environment that can contribute to autoimmune disease, which let's, that brings us to the second half of your question, which is why do we see a greater degree of prevalence of gluten sensitivity today versus, let's say, 50 years ago? I think one of the reasons why we see it is the general recommendation put forth by the government. You see that that, that food guide pyramid is only about 30 years old. And when it initially came out, it, it you know, it, it, it didn't come out as this scientific document that scientists got together and created. It came out as a, as a government policy to promote agriculture in the United States, the USDA. 
And, um, and, and so, but it was taken as gospel scientific truth and it was taught in schools for years. And so we indoctrinated an entire generation of people into the thought process that if they didn't get whole grains, that somehow they were going to be more or less unhealthy. Right. And so that one is that the recommendation went up Two, a lot of our flowers that are made today, the wheat flowers and the other forms of flour, we add gluten to them. We literally take vital wheat gluten and we add more to it. And the reason why is it changes the palatability of the grain when it's cooked. It makes it doughier, makes it chewier. So it brings about a greater desire. You know, these, these pizza crusts that you see coming out that are chewy and stretchy and, you know, same thing with the pastas and the breads. You know, these things are, are, are designed for humans to consume. I mean, the, the companies that make them want more customers. So they create a design right of a, of a product and in product that the customer is it's more palatable for the customer so they like it more they chew it more it doesn't break um it doesn't bleed the roof of their mouth because the bread is so hard that it breaks in their mouth right as the old tradition was breaking bread not chewing bread mm -hmm. there's a reason why because bread used to be a little bit crispier and a little bit harder so we've added gluten to the grain so we've got a much higher concentration of of, of gluten-based grain items we've got a governmental policy that says eat more grain. We've got gov government tax subsidies going to grow more grain to feed the poor. So, so it's 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 um it's kind of a culmination of all of these things happening. And then you also add the fact that antibiotic use is on the rise. Um, and now we're seeing the 50-year kind of mark of what antibiotics has done to the biome, to the microbiome in humans. And it strips away. There's five barriers in our gut. I talk about these in really in really big depth in the book. But there's five barriers that protect our gut from developing a leak and an autoimmune disease process. And one of those barriers is the microbiome, it's the bacteria. And so a lot of antibiotic use will take somebody who, they're already probably reacting to gluten, they're just not, they're just not allowing that reaction to leak into their bloodstream and go systemic and start affecting all of their tissues. It's isolated and localized to the gut, as it should be. The gut's job is to keep things that are bad for you, you know, in the gut and then poop them out right? It's not designed to let those bad things come through. So if those five barriers are breached in your gut, then that's when people start to really start manifesting more and more symptoms. So antibiotics, because they strip away one of the major barriers, but not just antibiotics. Many of the blood pressure medications also create a leaky gut. There's actually research now showing that certain classes of blood pressure medication actually induce leaky gut and mimic celiac disease. So cause all the same kind of barrier leakages, making a person more prone to that gluten reaction. We have drugs like aspirin and ibuprofen and other non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And these drugs have been shown to strip away one of the other barriers, the mucosal barrier. It's the layer of mucus that coats the GI tract in the stomach and protects it from, from uh, chemicals and other things penetrating into our bloodstream. That barrier is stripped away by these medications which makes it so ironic that we take a pain medication, right? To block the inflammation that, that the pain medication deficiency didn't cause the inflammation, but we use it to artificially manipulate the inflammation. And in the long haul, we actually induce a leaky gut as a result of that it leads to a perpetuation in the inflammation. Mm -hmm. And then we've got other classes of drugs. I mean, there's so many different classes of drugs that affect the GI tract, whether they affect the microbiome or whether they affect the mucosal barrier or whether they affect GI motility, like how the GI tract and the nervous system communicate to push contents of the gut out. Because so many people suffer with constipation that one of the things that happens is the toxic food that they're eating stays in the gut longer. So now we got this putrefaction and rotting that's occurring in the gut because they're not having bowel movements on a regular basis. And the, so the, the bacteria are trying to help out and they're eating this food and they're producing byproducts that potentially create inflammation and it can cause more leaky gut. So we get this kind of vicious cycle that just continues to perpetuate. So it's not, that's why I wrote the book because it's more than gluten deep. Everybody's all, you know, we bastardize gluten to this point that it's public enemy number one. Mm -hmm. But I think it's more important to understand that, look, not everybody's gluten sensitive, but there are a lot of people that have problem with grains as a whole because their guts in turmoil already and grain as it as it as its own nature is a seed and seeds are already anti-nutritive hard to digest hard to process we take a broken gut we dump pounds of seeds into it every day and expect that that broken gut is going to have the capacity to appropriately digest it without symptoms or side effects and it's foolhardy um, and we've kind of lost we've kind of lost sight in the in-tuneness of 
of diet being important in health in this country. And I think we're, we're coming to a head. We're coming to a, I call it a functional medicine head where people are starting to rediscover functional medicine, which really is nothing more than nutritional medicine, as you know, just being renamed under a broader scope. Yeah, really exciting stuff there. I love that last sound bite. I think our listeners are going to hit the rewind button to, to uh, check that out again. But Dr. Osborne, a couple things came to mind. And a lot of friends that I know that are not in the health space uh, are not necessarily sold on the gluten-free thing where their response is, oh, yeah, I eat wheat and I don't, I don't have any problems. I don't have any GI issues or upset. And so, you know, this connection between systemic and delayed onset ailments like you know autoimmunity or neurologic disorders alzheimer's uh what have you um what sort of tips would you say to them uh you know first for people that have friends that are not really committed to get off the grains uh, and then we'll, we'll finish off with pain but what do you say to that in terms of like okay yeah this stuff does take a while to brew just because you don't have symptoms doesn't mean it's not having an impact any words of wisdom yeah, i mean that's a, that's a great question mike i think i think there are a couple of things that i could say one is that you want to understand it the only known forms of acute disease, right, are either trauma, gunshot wound, knife stab, car accident, stuff like that, or infection, where we're running 100, 300, 4 fever. It's obvious. We're sick. We know we're sick. All other forms of disease, for the most part, are chronic degenerative, meaning you don't wake up one day and you have diabetes or Alzheimer's disease or heart disease. It's a progress, right? It's, like, it's kind of like you don't wake up one day overweight. It's a process where you've neglected your body and you've lacked exercise and you've eaten improperly. And over many, many years, you put a pound on this year, another few pounds the next year, and it accumulates over time. So, so the chronic diseases that we face as a whole society today are bioaccumulated damage over time. And it's, we're foolhardy if we're, if we're saying that hey, this doesn't affect me in any way. There's no way because I don't feel it directly. I don't get fat tomorrow because I don't exercise today. But if I don't consistently exercise then my, my morphology, my anthropometric data, my, my body fat composition is definitely going to change toward a negative effect and increase my risk for developing a number of different diseases. So that's kind of one fundamental thing to think about. But the other thing is delayed hypersensitivity responses, which, you know, by the name, delayed, means that it, it's, it's alternative of acute. Acute, if we define an acute allergy, the response comes within generally zero minutes to 30 minutes, meaning there's this kind of window where we'll feel a symptom, the lips will swell, the throat will constrict, we'll break out in hives, we'll cough, we'll itch, we'll wheeze, we'll sneeze, we'll have you know watery, teary, itchy eyes. Those are kind of the acute, you know, onset symptoms. Um, not everybody has acute onset symptoms. It's, there's two sides of our immune system. There's the acute side, and then there's the delayed side. And kind of think of this as almost an analogy to, um, you know, when you think about somebody who gets a virus. And there's this latency period, right? You get a virus, you get exposure, and you're not like sick right now because the virus got through your, through your tissue. There's a seven-day, 14-day, 21-day latency period before your immune system really starts to ramp up and you really start to manifest symptoms. And delayed hypersensitivity works on that same side of the immune system. It's called the delayed side. And so we make antibodies on this delayed side, IgG and IgA and IgM and IgD antibodies. There's four different classes. We make something called uh, a T cell response, which is a specific type of white blood cell directly will have this response of chemokines and cytokines and other chemicals that it can create as a result of exposure. But it takes time for these chemicals to ramp up. And then we have another kind of a response called an immune complex response or the complex response. And so, you know, those six other forms of delayed response, very few doctors measure them, unfortunately, um, because very few doctors are experts in immunology. Um, and even most of your allergists are only measuring the acute side of the equation, that zero to 30 minutes with a skin patch test or a skin prick test. Mm -hmm. so, so you've got this delayed response and the window is, is, you know, it's three hours to three weeks. So you can eat something and you don't necessarily have to feel bad immediately, but that inflammation can, can again, it's accumulative over time. So maybe it takes you two or three weeks and you're really mounting this immune response, but it's not so violent that it puts you down. Maybe maybe your body is resilient enough to kind of bounce back from that inflammation. But again, it's that as we accumulate that damage repetitively over and over and over and over again, the body loses its ability to adapt to that, that chronic inflammation. And what eventually happens is, is we fall prey to the disease. And that's when we get the diagnosis. When the disease becomes so obvious, we can no longer ignore it because our body has lost the ability to adapt to what we've done wrong to it. And, and, and again, that's, that's when the diabetes sets in. That's when 
the chronic pain syndrome set in. That's when the autoimmune disease sets in. It's it's not an overnight process. It take it can take two to three decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautifully said there. So you kind of lose your resilience slowly over time. And then it's like, you know, going away from for folks with children, like if you're with your child every day, you don't see them grow necessarily. But if you're gone for a week and come back, you're like, oh, my gosh, you grew a half an inch or something along those lines or a pet or what have you, you know, you can see that. When, so your, rel your baseline kind of keeps it's more subtle that change. So I really like that. Now let's go back to the medications. This is the other thing I, that I wanted to touch on and we're, today we're here to talk about pain. Um, the pain meds, particularly the opiates affect the GI tract and we've had other guests on the show talk about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and motility issues induced by taking pain meds. So this is why it's so important, Dr. Osborne, for people to, to know this and have your information in your book because what a great alternative to you know, avoiding some of these caustic medications, the opiates, which are addictive and harmful for the GI tract. So maybe let's talk about why pain meds are, are not the right way to go for pain. You know, with, with inflammation, I mean, if the pain is inflammatorily induced, meaning if the pain is caused from a source of inflammation, you know, we can, we can block the inflammation or we can block the way that we perceive the inf information. And so some of the opiates do just that. They block the way we perceive the inflammation in our brains. And they create a, it's they're highly addictive and they create um, a, a severe severe habit forming issue that over longer periods of time a person loses their tolerance to the drug and they have to take more and more and more to get the same effect but the side effects of the drug is they completely lock up the gi tract so we get severe constipation and so now again we get food that's putrefying in the gut we basically we get the gut that can't move so the food rots internally and that's going to set the stage for dysbiosis or abnormal gut flora. It's going to promote yeast overgrowth. The problem with that, Mike, is now when we promote yeast overgrowth, um, when you feed yeast in the gut grain, they convert it into, in a sense, alcohol. You actually develop your own distillery. So now you've got an alcohol problem, even though you're not an alcoholic. And so over time, it can lead to liver damage, which remember, many of these opiates are processed via the liver. So now you've got these drugs going through the liver. You've got alcohol coming in because of the dysbiosis caused by the drug. And you've just created and set up a vicious cycle that is never going to be fixed, um, no matter how many drugs or how many artificial chemicals you throw at it. And, it and, and, and the same goes with supplementation, although I will, to try to wean or help somebody get off of their pain medications, I'll use things like strong concentrated doses of omega-3. I'll use things like high concentrated versions of turmeric, you know, 95% curcuminoid, high concentration, one to three grams a day as a tool so that they're not in such severe pain as they're trying to titrate off of these other drugs. So again, some of them are addictive. So that the side effects of trying to wean off chills, fever, you know, the, the, the symptoms can, you know, of weaning off can be almost just as bad as the pain itself because of the addiction. And so we really want to try to make the quality of that patient's life much, much better as they're making that weaning process. Because for some people, it's not just, okay, I realize the drugs aren't good for me. I quit, right? It just, you've got to, there's got to be a kind of a monitoring weaning process that goes along with that. And so, but, but ultimately what, you know, what your listeners want to understand is that those pain medications do not fix the origin of the pain. They mask it. And if you mask the pain, what you're doing in essence is you're allowing yourself, your body to believe that it can continue to go on, right? So let's let's say it's physical pain in the knee or physical pain in the shoulder. Now you keep lifting weights, you keep riding the bike, you keep running, you run through it because you're blocking it and you don't feel it. Now you're detrimenting and deteriorating that joint to an even greater degree and you're setting yourself up for replacement surgeries, other forms of surgery, you know, doesn't matter the form of surgery, but you're setting yourself up for a complete demolishment of that joint and much more aggressive medical intervention later down the road, which the problem with that is um, now you've got this high, high state of inflammation. Now you want to go induce more inflammation by scheduling a traumatic surgery, right? <laughs> and so you're already not healing. And so now you've induced this surgical damage in an attempt to try to heal it, but your body isn't in a place where it can heal. So, so many people have a kind of a non-surgical response. They have what's called failed surgery syndrome where, you know, the surgery didn't do anything other than make the problem worse because now they have all this scar tissue that their body's trying to heal and they're already overly inflamed. And so now their body is busy trying to heal the wound instead of repairing the damaged joint that was, that was originally damaged in the first place. So we get this, it just becomes a vicious, vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. So I mean, the, the way out of that, I call it the prescription pain trap. And the way out of that is you, you've got to one, educate yourself that, 
the drug isn't the solution. It may give you a temporary fix. And, 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 and in that sense, okay, but let's, what's the long-term plan, right? You can't use the drug forever. So what's the real plan? What's the long-term plan? And it has to be comprehensive. And part of it has to be, you know, part of it, if it's a physical pain, has to be rehabilitative in nature, meaning you've got to address muscular weakness, muscular imbalance, proprioceptive imbalance, neurological problems. Those are, you know, very important issues to address. But the other part, and that for most people is an area that gets addressed. A lot of chiropractors, a lot of physical therapists address those areas fantastically well. But the piece that gets ignored by most is this nutritional piece. You are what you eat. If you're gluten sensitive and you're eating grain, you're you're a train you're a train wreck waiting to happen. If you're not gluten sensitive and you're eating grain and you're chronically inflamed, um, and maybe you have this mold reaction, maybe you have a heavy metal response because some of these grains are high in mercury and cadmium and arsenic. Those are things we really didn't talk about yet. But you know, some of these grains are are high in pesticide and creating. I mean, again, it's it's multifactorial. It's not just gluten. You know, if you suffer with chronic pain and and here's the kicker: if you suffer with it but you don't know why and your only solution has been to medicate, then you're on a road to disaster and you need to get intelligent about it and you need to take a more meaningful approach. And that begins with what you put in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Very important stuff. And you talked about vicious cycles and in your book, I love you have a lot of charts and diagrams and circles to really educate people about you know, what's going on here. And, and one of the vicious cycles that I've experienced, and again, you have to have this in your book, is you talk about how pain causes depression. And I think, and then that leads to immobility and loss of muscle. And we've talked about muscle before on, on some of your programs. Um, now talk about some of these vicious cycles and, and what you see with patients and, uh, you, know, you know, why it's important, you know, again, just to reinforce cleaning up the diet to kind of remove the source of this. Well, the grain depression cycle is 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 very clear in that many many um, many people react to grains and, and it affects their nervous system. So it's going to affect the, their their capacity to properly generate um, neurochemistry. In other words, for nerve message to be properly communicated, and so they can actually develop a state of depression. There's you know goes way back. I mean, one of the earliest known names of gluten sensitivity is called bread madness because it could actually induce for many people a schizophrenic state, so altering of the mind. But just like it creates, just like grain can create a leaky gut, it can also create a leaky brain. And so what it does is it opens up the blood-brain barrier and allows chemicals that don't belong in the brain to have access to the brain, which then sets the brain up for chronic inflammation. And one of the side effects to that is depression. So what does a person who's depressed do? Well, they generally don't want to exercise. They're depressed. So that they have a kind of a suppression of their desire to get up and be mobile and be active and then that sets the stage for a further deterioration of their joints and muscles right we, we you know there's the old saying um use it or lose it and and bone grows based on a, a law called wolf's law which means that bone grows based on pressure so where there's pressure there's increased bone density that's why people who don't exercise tend to have more bone loss than people that do that's why astronauts that go into outer space where there's no gravity and no external force or pressure on their bone lose their bone density the longer they're in space so we, so we have that fundamental law. Then we have the law of muscular growth. And that law is that if you put muscle under pressure, it will grow. It will grow in strength. It will basically increase in size and increase in strength and increase in, in um, oxygenation, increase in blood flow. It will help you utilize blood sugar better. So it will regulate your blood sugar better and prevent obesity better. So, you know, when you're depressed, you don't feel like moving. So, you're, you know, the, the act of not moving leads to deterioration of the muscle too. We don't use it. We lose it. But in the joint, one of the most fundamental things that you want to understand is that blood supply reaches your muscle, but blood supplies don't reach joints. Joints do not have a direct blood supply. They are nourished through the synovial fluid that bathes the cartilage. And the only way that happens, that nourishment occurs through motion and movement. So if we have somebody who's sedentary, sitting at a desk for eight hours a day on a computer, somebody who's inactive and, and just got it, you know, whether it's a job or whether it's depression and they're just not exercising, their joints deteriorate faster and it, you know, so again, it sets up a vicious cycle. You can develop pain just from being sedentary, sit for eight hours and see how stiff you become. Now multiply that for five years and throw grain into your diet and throw other bad things for you into your diet. And you're going to set this cycle up you know, to be quite prolific. And then that leads to another cycle called the grain obesity cycle, which is, you know, for many people, the grain itself actually induces hormonal change. Because it creates inflammation, it causes your body's normal response to it is to try to make more cortisol. Cortisol is the hormone we make to fight inflammation. That's why if you ever had a joint injury, sometimes doctors want to inject you with a, with a corticosteroid. They want to inject you with a steroid or give you an oral steroid. That's cortisol. 
right? Your body makes cortisol to fight your own inflammation. But if you've been eating foods that are chronically inflammatory and you've been forcing your body to try to overcompensate by making more and more cortisol, again, you multiply that by five or 10 years and you're going to end up with adrenal burnout. And then that adrenal burnout or that adrenal failure leads to an inability to adapt or cope to the inflammation. So then the inflammation, now you have no fire trucks to put it out. Yeah. And so now it just gets out of control. And, uh, and when your adrenal glands go, when your adrenal glands get worn out, you, you've got big, big problems because, because now your natural inflammatory control mechanism is gone. And so what, one, of the, one of the things that happens as a side effect of that is excessive insulin production. And so then we start storing fat. Um, cortisol causes bloating and retention and water weight gain, and then insulin causes fat storage. And so then we get in, because we're inflamed and because we're eating the wrong foods that are creating this inflammatory cycle and those hormones, they're, they're changing. Over time, they're changing and they're making more and more and more. And then we actually end up in this state of fat storage. And so we end up marbleizing our own muscle tissue. Just like you take a cow and pin it up to marbleize the meat, you end up marbleizing your meat. And so your muscles become marbleized, they become less muscular. They become more fatty, so you develop a fatty muscular tissue, and then your metabolism drops because muscle sets the metabolic rate. Muscle is the number one determining factor for whether or not you're going to be successful losing weight and whether you have enough or whether you don't because the act of having muscle allows you to burn more calories at rest. And so if you're marbleizing your fat, your metabolism will slow down, and if you're eating the same quantity of calories today that you did five years ago, only today your muscles are marbleized and don't have the metabolism, you're going to slowly put on more and more weight. And then that excessive weight plus gravity on your joints compresses your joints, creates more wear and tear, creates more cartilage damage, makes it hurt, makes it painful to walk. And so now you're avoiding exercise and activity altogether because you've gained the weight and, and the actual physical gravitational force plus the fat increase your pain. And so you, you've, you've developed this stance of, oh, it hurts to exercise, so I'm not going to, right. but you haven't changed your diet. So you continue to create dietary inflammation, which continues to cause you to gain weight, which continues to cause you to hurt when you try to exercise, which continues to lead to weight gain. So you get stuck in the vicious cycle. Again, that's called grain obesity. And, and it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a hard road to dig out of that once you're really trapped in it, but not impossible to dig out of. It just it requires one knowledge. You've got to understand that's what's happening. Two, you've got to have a diet change in there. And three, you've got to, you've got to introduce the types of exercises that are not going to be so dramatic or traumatic on your joints and tendons and ligaments that it would create, you know, repetitive use or, or, or um, pressure based inflammation and just things like whole body vibration or pull work, you know, where you remove the gravity so that you can start the initial weight loss cycle before you can gravitate into exercise, you know, like high intensity interval training and things of that nature. Yeah. Now, do you see more chronic pain in people that are overweight? Is that a theme in your practice? It is and it isn't. I mean, I get, I get just as many people underweight or, or, or average weight as I do being overweight. I, I think it's because it can, you know, you know, the old thing is it can have just like, just like grain can cause diarrhea, it can also cause constipation. Just like it can cause obesity, it can also cause failure to, to be able to put on muscle. Some people, the grain, the way it affects them is it damages their gut lining to such a severe degree they become malnourished. So no matter how many calories they're really eating, they're not absorbing the vitamins and the minerals, so they can't actually put on the muscle. And uh, plus, they've developed autoimmune disease, so their immune system is stealing protein from the muscle to try to fight the food. And that, you know, again, that sets up an environment where they're un incapable or incapable of, of, of putting on mass if they're underweight, or, or just the opposite. It creates a hormonal environment that, that causes them to, to put the weight on. Again, everybody's different in their response. And that's not, to, that's not to try to say that, hey, grain is a catch-all, no matter what's wrong with you, it's just grain. Look, I'm a big believer and advocate in testing. And, you know, it was one of the questions you asked, we kind of sidetracked it, but, you know, genetic testing for gluten, it, to me, is a crucial piece because if you're going to make somebody change their diet for the rest of their life, you damn sure better have a good justification for doing it. Otherwise, you're guessing. And, and you know, I, I like to use the sugar analogy here, Mike. How many people know sugar's bad form? Everyone, right? But how many people still eat it? Everyone. Right, mm -hmm. because there's no black and white for them. There's no justification that if they do eat it, what the outcome and what the consequence is going to be. Because you know, one is human hubris, right? They they just feel like they're immortal. They're young enough where they feel like oh, I can do what I want and it's not really going to affect me. But the other is because they they don't have a parameter that's staring in the face that's saying, hey, if you eat this, this is going to be your potential outcome for sure. And we know that about you. This is genetic. It's not going away. So I'm a big believer in testing. 
Yeah. So let's dive in, finish off a little bit here, Dr. Osborne. Wonderful information, by the way. And the other thing I wanted to highlight and you talk about it in your book is, you know, muscle is anti-inflammatory in its own right. And you talked about just the act of moving muscle releases, myokines that suppress inflammation. So, you know, we're thinking along the same lines here. And that's why I love your book and your work, because you can articulate it so well. And, you know, these vicious cycles, I think, are really important for people to understand so that they can you know, take the steps in their life to to make lifestyle changes and dietary uh, changes to improve their health. But let's, if you could, if we could finish off and, and talk about the 30-day diet plan. And you mentioned earlier that sometimes you don't want to start off with supplements because you want to see if the diet is working. So at what point do we introduce some of the supplements and some of the things to kind of accelerate the healing process here? Well, there are some supplements that I, that I recommend that we introduce, not because of any other reason than they're essential. Mm -hmm. So there's there's two kinds of, of options when it comes to supplements. There's what we call essential and there's what we call non-essential. And if we define essential, we're defining essential as these are supplements that your body cannot produce internally, but your if your body doesn't have them, it can't function. Um, and so like an example of that would be omega-3. Omega-3 is an essential nutrient. And omega-3, what it does is, you know, it's, it's, it's profound in its, in its effect at blocking inflammation. It's profound in its impact and effect at thinning the blood. So, so we've got these, you know, when we thin the blood, we can deliver more nutrients and more oxygen. So let's just take that person who's been just loaded up on grain. They have the opposite of omega-3. They have tons of omega-6. Their blood is too thick. They've got hyperinflammation. Giving them strong doses of, of omega-3 isn't medicinal in terms of, of masking. It's medicinal in terms of their body is so devoid of that particular nutrient. We've got to get it up just to catch them up, just to get them back on par. We're not artificially manipulating their chemistry with an herb. Um, we're, we're actually giving their body the essential nutrient that it's been lacking for years because their diet has been so poor. So when it comes to supplementation, the vitamins, the minerals, the essential fats, become very, very crucial because you've got to have the fundamental building blocks for their bodies to heal and repair, if that makes sense. So, you know, we can, we can surmise that, a you know, one of the things I would, I would say, if you're not getting the testing done, so if you're just a person saying, what can I do? No doctors involved. I just want to take action steps. One, you know, a very, very potent, strong multivitamin, obviously that's grain free and preferably GMO free. Two, a very strong concentrated dose of omega-3 okay that that's been tested for mercury and been tested for contaminants and lead and other things so that you're not introducing some other chemical into the equation that could create inflammation those two things fundamentally will be extremely helpful now the third thing that can be done that's extremely helpful that is an essential piece is proteolytic enzyme and the reason why is these people that have been eating all this grain as a base of their food their gut produces enzymes all of our guts do but what happens when we eat hard to digest foods is we wear our pancreas down. We wear our GI tract down. And so it becomes deficit. It becomes a state of deficit. So what a proteolytic enzyme does is it helps naturally modulate inflammation. And we would make our own if we didn't have a gut that was in such disrepair and we didn't have a body that was so hyperinflamed. So those three probably would be the, the ones I'd pull off the shelf first because of their essentiality in this process. And then we could pick and choose other things. If, for example, if they were trying to wean off of a drug, if they were trying to, you know, really, really get aggressive at, 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 at taking it to another level, but they wanted to use some things that were natural that might advance the process a little bit more. But ultimately, the goal being don't rely on turmeric for the rest of your life either. Don't rely, you know, so you see what I'm saying? Don't rely on this herb or this concoction or this tincture for the rest of your life either. You've got to get to a point where when you pull all the pills away, it's just you and how you feel and you should feel great and you should feel pain free. And if that's not the case, then you haven't figured it out yet. So, so those would be that, that would be my attitude about the supplements. If you're not getting tested, as far as the 30 day program goes, I, I break it up into a 15 day cycle and then a secondary 15 day cycle And it more for anything. It's just to allow a person to naturally gravitate toward a more meaningful diet. In other words, the first 15 days are not quite as aggressive, in the elimination in the last 15 days we get more aggressive and i know that people like graduation right they like to be able to say okay i need to i need to take it in baby steps this allows them to take it in baby steps now many of the people like in my clinic they don't do baby steps at all they go right to the full fledged but but we also do very very advanced testing where we know exactly what foods they should should never eat 
We know exactly what they should and shouldn't do in terms of supplementation. We've ruled out the four primary reasons the inflammation might be there, which are the food, um, environmental chemicals or poisons or toxins. We've ruled out vitamin and mineral deficiencies and, and what they need. And then we've also ruled out infections because some people develop chronic infections that can lead to chronic inflammation and pain in their joints. It's notorious for especially with people with autoimmune problems. So we rule those things out clinically so that we have the exact action step for that person. But the book is designed to take a person who's not doing, you know, who's not visiting with a functional medicine doctor and going through all this advanced type of testing, but they want to have tools that work, right? And if they just dive into it, it will work. I can guarantee there's very few guarantees in life, but I can guarantee that if you suffer with chronic pain and, uh, and you, and you go through that process and you don't feel better, uh, call me, I'll refund your money. I, I got 16 years of experience in my clinic and I, I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that that process won't work. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I've been to your clinic. It's a beautiful new office and, and you teach doctors, you know, how not only the business side of things, but the clinical side. So uh, I, I think our listeners are going to be fully convinced in the way that you articulated this is really awesome. So again, the book, Dr. Osborne is No Grain, No Pain. It's available January 26, 2016. And I'll post the show notes and links to Amazon where folks, if they click through that link at highintensityhealth.com slash DR Osborne, you can help support the show. So one final question I have for you, Dr. Osborne, and this is related to your book, but but not really. You run a busy practice. You have a great family. Uh, you're writing books and doing all these online uh, educational resources for people at the Gruden Free Society. What is your morning routine? We want to kind of get to know you a little <laughs> bit better as a person and want to know, you know, how do you structure your day that makes you so successful, healthy, and vibrant? It's now 7 o'clock, your, your time, and, and you're just ready to keep going for another hour, I bet. So tell us about, like, your, your daily and morning routine. So I, I always wake up around 5. And uh, I'm a CrossFitter. I love to go to CrossFit. It's just a community that I've gravitated toward. I, I like the workouts. I like the way it pushes me. So, you know, 530 workout and I'm usually home around 640 or so. Um, and then I relax. I just I relax and recover from the workout, uh, have a little bit of light breakfast. I'm generally not a heavy breakfast eater, but I from about 645 to about 839, um, you know, I spend a little bit of time relaxing in there. But then I it's one of my most probably my most um, functional times. My brain is on fire and it's very, very vibrant at that time of the day and I can get a lot done. I can get two to three times more done mentally in that early morning time frame because I'm not interrupted by other things. Nobody's bothering me. It's just kind of me in the world. And so I can, I can write, I can blog, I can shoot videos. I can think about, you know, the patients that I have for that day and kind of prepare for my clinic. Um, you know, so it gives me that opportunity. And then I, you know, and then I, my clinic starts at nine. And so generally I'm, I'm in with patients from about nine to about four and, uh, it just depends on the day, but it's usually like that Monday through Wednesday. I, you know, I work three days a week in the clinic and, uh, and then from about four on, I'm doing more prep work. I'm doing, I'm doing more writing. Um, you know, I'm catching up on patient notes if I have notes to catch up on, but in the in the middle, in the midst of that, I usually bring in, I bring my lunch eat in the office and you know it's always a home cooked meal so it's whatever we had for dinner the night before my wife is very good to me um, she makes plenty of food and she makes the right kind of food so she supports she supports me wholeheartedly nutritionally and our children so and then you know when I when I'm ready to close out my day now now these 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 two months here where we're doing this book prep and this book launch is you know we're burning a little bit later because we're just prepping and doing so much more because we want it to be successful and I think, you know, it, you know, anybody knows that success does come with a price. It doesn't just fall in your lap. And so sometimes you've got to work a little bit harder than others. But in a general, in the general course of the week, I really try to get out of my office at a reasonable hour so they can go home and spend some time with my family. You know, I'm only in the clinic Monday through Wednesday. So, you know, I've got Thursday, Friday where I can, I have the option. And usually I'll, I'll wake up early those mornings, do a little bit of work, but not, not a whole day intensive. And then I'll spend time with the, with the family and, and uh, you know, I like to take a vacation here and there too. So, you know, it, there's a balancing piece to this as well. I, I think, I think, you know, I mean, if I'm giving advice, doling out advice about lifestyle, it's, it, you know, if you have a partner, the partner's got to understand that sometimes you've got to burn the men out of oil and sometimes you need to balance and it's not always a perfect medium. And, and, and so, you know, having a partner who understands you, I just say that, there's always the, the formula behind every successful man is a, is a very intelligent and very successful woman who sometimes takes the back seat to that successful man. My wife is, is a perfect example of somebody who doesn't want to be in the limelight and doesn't want to shine that way. She just, 
she's just my wing, you know, she just supports me in everything that I do. And, and, uh, so I'm very, very fortunate to have found the right partner. And I think that's very, very critical. Now, if you're, if you're not married, then, then a lot of it just becomes self-motivation and you've got to be very, very well organized. So you've got to have a meal plan. You've got to have a guide to a meal plan. And so what I've had, what I've seen a lot of really successful people do is, um, is hire chefs. They bring in a chef to cook their meals because they just don't have time to do it themselves. They're busy with, with whatever it is that they're trying to get done and accomplish. So that works really, really well too. So that's what I would do if I didn't, if I didn't have such a wonderful, such a wonderful wife. Yeah. I remember we had bacon wrap dates and all kinds of like a lot of people say, Oh, we're going to have good, healthy food, but there's, there's always some junk in there. And, and at your open house, uh, cause I think you would just open the doors in that clinic uh, about a year ago, uh, just amazing food. And so you, you really practice what you're preaching. So there's a you know, great answer to that final question. So Dr. Osborne, how can our listeners learn a little bit more about you? Do you have a, a website for the book? And, and if people want to contact you, what's the best resource? Yeah. So I've got, I've got a few different resources for the book. It's no grain, no pain book dot com um, and they can learn more about the book and get information about it there um, as far as my clinic is concerned it's dr peter osborne.com dr peter osborne.com and if they want to know more about grain as a whole and just get some great free information and education we have a quiz there too that they can take it if they don't want to take genetic testing they can do our little mini quiz it's about 30 questions um, and that's glutenfreesociety.org and you know i have a huge uh, I have a huge archive of video libraries and informational blog pieces that anybody can get on there and look at and take a look at for free and get educated. Well, that concludes this episode of High Intensity Health Radio. Hope you found that discussion informative. I know I learned a lot and was just really motivated and inspired after chatting with Dr. Osborne. A really great guy, as you can tell towards the end, he just you know talked freely about his life and his structure and his schedule. I find those discussions very motivating and informative. So thanks again for tuning in and subscribing. Uh, if you want to check out the show notes, like I mentioned before, do that over at highintensityhealth.com slash Osborne, where you can see the first interview that we did with Dr. Osborne. It really that took it deep dive into Zane and corn a little bit deeper than we talked about today. So I think you'll find that discussion informative as well. So with that, we'll catch you on the next episode. Hope you have a fabulous, healthy day.